All right, welcome my Z stars to another awesome video for AP Statistics. This video is for testing a claim about a proportion. These are called tests of significance or hypotheses tests. I cannot, I mean, this video is it. This video will tell you everything you need to know, most of the big details, small details that come in later videos, but please, please, please check this out. This is going to help you tremendously. And there will be another video about testing a claim about a mean. So be prepared to watch that one too. All right, let's just get right down to it. To test a claim about a proportion, it is a strict four-step process. I recommend labeling your steps. Step one, create hypotheses about the claim. Step two, check the conditions needed to build a model. Step three, find the p-value. Now, there are three steps to finding a p-value. A, you got to build the model, assuming the claim is true. Two, you got to locate your z-score in that sample. And thirdly, you got to find the probability of your sample or more extreme occurring, which is called the p-value. And then four, when you're all done with that, you make a conclusion. And we're going to go through all those steps right now, but I wanted to do so based on a problem. That way we can actually solve a problem along the way. So here's the problem. Mars Incorporated claims that 20% of original Skittles are orange. To test this claim, we will select a sample of 60 random Skittles for a, from a large batch, and we find out that 21 are orange. Is the percent of orange Skittles larger than what Mars Incorporated claims? Sorry for some typos in there, but if you're a student of mine, you know that those typos come with the territory. All right, so in our sample, 21 out of 60 are orange. That is 0.35. So basically what we got to do is we got to put their t claim to the test. The Mars Incorporated, the maker of Skittles, claims that 20% are orange. Our sample shows 35. Now, if I ask my grandma what's going on here, she's going to say, oh my gosh, clearly 35% shows that Skittles is lying. But not necessarily, right? Because things are allowed to vary a little bit. And that's why we're going to run this test to answer that question. So here we go. All right, we went through the four steps. Let's go individually now. Step one is the hypotheses. Now, there are three options here, but you're going to notice a lot of similarities between them. You will have to read the problem to know which to choose. So I'm going to go through the options. Now, first option, well, let's put it this way. The null is always the same. The null hypothesis, which we write as H sub zero, this is the null hypothesis. This is that the claim is true. This is us saying, well, I guess Skittles is telling the truth, and the true proportion is 0 0.20. Now, the alternative hypothesis, which we abbreviate with an H and a little a there, this is the option that has three options, right? So the alternative hypothesis could be that the truth is greater than 20%, less than 20%, or simply not equal to 20%. Now, how do you know which one to choose? you got to read the problem. If you go back to you know my problem, you can again rewind if you want to go back to it, but I said that we're concerned is there a larger proportion of Skittles that are orange than they claim. So our alternative is that the true proportion is greater than 20%. Now, if I would have stated that as saying, hey, I wonder if it's less than 20%, well, then you would go ahead and use a less than sign. Or if I just said, hey, I want to know, is it something different? I don't care if it's higher. Heck, I don't care if it's lower. I just wonder if it's something different. Then you would use a not equal to sign. But other than that, everything else stays the same. Do not use any p hats. You will never use the symbol p hat in a hypothesis. You will never use the value of a p hat in a hypothesis. You always reference the true proportion and your claim that they said was true. Your alternative, the only difference between the null and the alternative is that symbol in the middle. Again, greater than, less than, or not equal to. For our particular problem, we are concerned that maybe there is a larger proportion of orange Skittles. All right, step two, the conditions. In order for us to build a sampling distribution that's going to tell us what to expect and what is significant, we need to check our three conditions. So the sample must have been selected randomly to avoid bias. The sample of 60 Skittles must be less than 10% of the population. I did say it was a large batch. And now this is so that independence can be assumed. And the sample must have 10 or more successes and failures. If you recall, I did have 21 orange Skittles. That is more than 10. 
and 60 minus 21 means that there were 39 non-orange Skittles. Both of those numbers must be 10 or greater so that the normal model can be used. This is the one step that nobody likes doing because it involves writing a couple sentences out. But use this as a template. Write out some sentences just like what I wrote here, and you usually will get the points for that. All right. Whoops, sorry, went too low. All right, here we go. Now we got to actually do the work. This is honestly my favorite part. I love doing the actual math work. All right, first, remember this is a three-step process. As I outlined earlier, I have to build the model. So the first thing I have to do is I'm going to assume that the truth is 20%, right? I'm going to assume that that is true. So that means that if I'm building my sampling distribution, the mean of all samples, well, should be 20%, right? I mean, that should be what's true if that is in fact true. But I also totally understand that some samples are going to deviate. So the sampling distribution will have a standard deviation that can be calculated by the square root of 0.2 times 0.8 divided by my sample size. So I'm going to go on my calculator real quick and do that. If you want to do along with me, that's great. If you just want to trust me, that's cool too. And I get 0.0516. So now I could build my sampling distribution. How do I know it's normal? Because I passed that third condition. I had 10 or more successes and failures. Right smack dab in the center is going to go the claim of 20%. Then I'm going to go up, 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 and down, down, down. Now, for the pure sake of this very tiny, rough drawing, I'm going to go ahead and round my standard deviation to 0 0.05. So that's 0 0.25, 0 0.30, and 0.35 and then 0 0.15, 0 0.10, and 0 0.05. So this model shows me that the large majority of samples should be in this region somewhere, and very, very rarely will a sample be too high or too low. All right, so now it's time to locate my sample. My sample, if you recall, was that 21 out of 60 Skittles were orange. That's 35%, 0.35. So now I have to locate it on that model. Well, it's right around here. Now remember, I did a little bit of rounding with my standard deviation, but it's right around there. But to exactly locate it, I need the z-score. That's going to be taking my sample proportion minus the assumed truth divided by the standard deviation. All right, once again, we go to my calculator. If you want to do it with me, that's great. If you just want to trust me, that'd be awesome too. And um, I get a z-score of 2.9070, 2.9070. Now, if you look at my picture, you might say, well, wait a minute, Mr. Perinchak, that should be exactly three. Yeah, but remember, I did a little bit of rounding. So the exact value with the proper standard deviation is right, again, right around there, 2.9070. Now, you know, if you use the eye test, this is clearly a high sample. This is clearly an unlikely z-score. That's a very high z-score. And the z-score actually confirms what my eyes were telling me, that this is a pretty high value. This is a pretty significant sample. But finally, I do need a probability to really solidify this. And that probability is called a p-value. A p-value is the probability of your sample occurring or more extreme. Now, what do I mean by or more extreme? Well, if your sample is higher than the claim, or more extreme would be even higher. If your sample was below the claim, or me, more extreme would be even lower. So for me, I'm going to find the probability that a sample comes back higher than, whoa, what the heck was I using there? I was using a really wrong symbol. I'm very sorry. Um, I'm trying to find the probability that my sample proportion is greater than 0.35. Now remember, this is the same thing as finding the probability that my z-score is greater than 2.9070. And again, this is called a p-value. It's the probability of your sample value occurring or more extreme if the claim is true. So now how do I get this p-value? Well, you need your calculator. Remember, normal CDF is how you find probability if you follow a normal model. I'm going to start at 2.9070. That was my z-score. I'm going to go to a low or to an upper value of 99 because remember, or more extreme for my high value would be even higher. And this will get me my p-value. And I get 0.0018. So the probability 
of my sample occurring or more extreme is 0 0.0018. And again, that is very unlikely. So what did I learn through all my work here? I learned what should happen with my sampling distribution. And then I learned that my sample, well, is very high and shouldn't happen because that is a very, very low probability. All right, now we have to make a conclusion. If you're truly understanding all of this, you should already know what that conclusion is. We should not be seeing such an extremely significantly high sample proportion, but we did. And that can mean only one thing, Skittles is lying to us. The true proportion of orange Skittles is more than 20%. All right, now, how do we actually make that conclusion properly? Well, there are two different options for a conclusion, and they're all based on your p-value. Now, what we do is we compare that p-value to something called our level of significance. Now, the level of significance is known as alpha, and this is basically how strict we want to be on saying something is significant or not. Most people go with 1% or 5%. Meaning that anything below 1 or below 5% is significant. Now, in our example, we had a probability of 0.0018. So I don't care what alpha level you use, that is significantly low. All right, so there's two options here. If your p-value is under the level of significance, which is happening in our example, this means our sample is very significant. It was way out on that tail. Now recall, since we don't believe in rare probabilities, it means that we do have evidence that the alternative is true. And our alternative was that the proportion of orange Skittles is more than 20%. So in this example, we're going to go with option A. We do have evidence. Our sample does provide evidence that the proportion of orange Skittles is more than 20%. Now let me go back here real quick and explain this. Here's my thought process, right? What we saw happen, what we saw happen was extremely unlikely. It was way over here on our model. Now, what I say to my students is when something unlikely happens, it actually means it wasn't unlikely. What? Wrap your brain around that. Well, here's what I'm trying to say. When something crazy high happens like this right here, 0.35, we don't believe in those rare things occurring statistically. So the only way that 35% could happen is if I picked up this whole model and moved it over. Then all of a sudden, sorry for the poor drawing, but then all of a sudden my sample proportion would not be weird anymore. So that's what I mean when I say when something unlikely happens, that's a, that signals to me that it somehow wasn't unlikely. And what that means is that the whole model is truly up more where the true proportion of orange Skittles is more than 20%. How about that? All right. So that is option A. And that is what happens when your p-value is very low under your level of significance. So that's exactly what happened to us. Now, the other option is if your p-value is above the level of significance. All right. This means that your sample was not significant at all. This means we do not have evidence that the alternative is true. Now, this does not mean that the null is true. We never, ever say the null is true. This just means there's no evidence to say otherwise. So let me kind of run you through a quick example here with this. Let's just pretend for one hot second that our sample came back right around here, maybe 22%, right? Now, that is not a significant sample. Your eyes could tell you that. The probability of that sample occurring or more extreme would be very, very high. It would be very, very likely. And likely things are what's supposed to happen if the claim is true. So when something like that would happen, it would produce a large p-value because there is a lot of probability above that. And a large p-value would cause us to go with option B. And if you have a large p-value above your level of significance, then that means that your sample was not a very special sample at all. Sorry to break it to you. And this means that we do not have evidence to say that the alternative is true. So we cannot say that the true proportion of orange Skittles is more than 20%. All we could say is that we do not have enough evidence to go against the null.
We're not going to go ahead and say that the null is 100% ironclad true. We just don't have enough evidence to say otherwise. And that's what's going to happen when you do these significance tests. One of these two things is going to happen. You're either going to find a sample that is crazy high or crazy low that is significant, or a sample that is just, well, plain old normal. So this is it, guys. This is the work that goes into it. Now, in class, we're going to really refine exactly what all this work looks like on your paper and how you have to word your answer. But this video gives you a quick run, run through it all. There will be another video coming shortly that will give you a full example, like full example, beginning to end, all the work nice and neat. That way you could see it all. I mean, this video has it all as well. But I just want to make sure everybody's aware that you got to keep practicing these. You got to see different things happen so you can understand the different conclusions. But this video pretty much covers it all. Watch it a couple times if you need to. I'll catch you on the other side. Good luck. Hopefully it all makes sense to you. If it doesn't, keep watching more videos. See you later.